Foundry is a great uh, place for that kind of stuff. I'm uh, John Spencer, I'm the uh, school deputy dean. Uh, Paul and Christine can't be here, I'll say you about that in a few moments. But I want to welcome you to the Foundry uh, as part of our society's celebration of International Women's Day. Uh, we've got a very international audience uh, of staff, students, and guests today. Uh, and I thought it was worth reminding ourselves, therefore, why, particularly for the UK, um, 2018 marks a particularly special year in human rights. There are two main reasons. Um, the first is around representation. Uh, 100 years ago, almost of the month, in fact, the 6th of Feb, 1918, a pioneering law was passed in the form of the Representation of the People Act. Uh, after the campaigning for the suffragette amendment. Thank you. He's better. Thank you. <laughs> after the campaigning for the suffragette amendment. Uh, and this is an important law because it allowed women, as you will know, to vote for the very first time. And it also men over 21, all the men over could vote for the first time. It was only the start of a process because actually the law said that women over the age of 30 who occupied a house or who were married to someone who did could now vote. But that was only 8.5 million women. So there was working progress for 10 years to get those equal representation rights in place. The second reason uh, is, I suppose, more personal, actually, from an academic point of view, more resonant. Um, it was 100 years ago that Mary Stokes, a pioneer of birth control, published her influential, controversial book, Married Love. It was a huge hit in the UK. It was banned in the US for nearly 20 years. Uh, and it brought sort of birth control into wider public discourse. Uh, and for my point of view, it was interesting because Mary was also an academic. Uh, she was a paleobotanist. And in fact, she was the first woman academic at uh, Manchester University, uh, appointed in 1904. Uh, and I think we could learn a lot from that, uh, that experience. Now, both of these events, I think, for the UK were very much the forerunners of uh, today's focus on press for progress. 100 years on, as the hashtag suggests, there is still, I think, a requirement to press forward and progress gender parity. Here's just one example. Uh, in a letter published today in the Telegraph by 200 business leaders in the UK, entrepreneurs and academics, there's a call for government to boost female entrepreneurship in Britain. The authors argued that female entrepreneurs, quote, are being unfairly held back and their access to capital restricted, with just 9% of funding into UK startups currently going to women-run businesses annually. So this isn't just a women's issue, of course, the authors argue. This has an impact on the UK economy as a whole. Now, we're fully supportive in the school of, the, of these initiatives, but actually it's particularly appropriate that we are meeting today in the foundry, set up under Anna's ABLE direction last year to support student-led innovation across the university, irrespective of gender. As she said, um, showcasing positive role models uh, is an important part of tackling the diversity question in entrepreneurship, and we have plenty to go on. Through people like Joyita Das, MBA alum, founder of the data visualization startup Guiana, People like uh, um, uh, Afa Raymond uh, from MBA from 2016, uh, who is uh, recognized as the MBA star category in last year's Women for the Future uh, awards for her work as a co-founder of Virtue, the uh, healthcare startup. We have plenty of role models to, to work from. We're also proud, as we'll hear no doubt from Peter in a few moments, that 41% of our current MBA class is composed of women, the highest in Europe. We've created and funded a number of dedicated scholarships and senior execs return to the school on a regular basis through our Women Transforming Leadership Program to reflect on the next stage of their career and build the confidence that they need to achieve their goals. But really, we're here for a particular event today. So to today's event, uh, let me set the scene. Uh, we're really delighted that one of our foremost female leaders, uh, an Oxford alumni, Baroness uh, Shruti Vadera, is joining us today to share with us some of the insights into overcoming some of the challenges that she has faced in her career. Shruti is currently chair of Santander UK, but she's also a politician and for us, more importantly, a member of the school's Global Leadership Council. And her career has been enormously impressive. Until September 2009, she was a government minister, jointly for the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills in the Cabinet Office. Um, following his appointment as Prime Minister in 2007, Gordon Brown appointed her as Parliamentary Under Secretary of State uh, in the Department of International Development. And although she later stepped down as a minister to take up a new role advising the G20, she's very active in this respect. She was appointed to the boards of BHP Billiton, AstraZeneca as non-exec director, and four years later she joined Santander UK. So she's experienced 
life in senior roles in both the UK government and in global industry. Uh, Shriti will be discussing her perspectives insights with Cathy during our lunch. Um, uh, Cathy Harvey, our Associate Dean, but welcome Shriti. Before we get on there to the serious business of having lunch uh, and, uh, and finding out from our fellow diners what uh, press progress means to each of us, I'd like to show you to play a, just a short video recorded by Peter Tofano, our Dean. Sadly, Peter, it's the first time he's missed uh, one of these events. He's unfortunately traveling in the States. I hope he's managed to escape the, the latest storms on the East Coast in his travels. But he has uh, left us a, a video message that I think we're going to play for you now. Welcome to the beautiful and new Oxford Foundry to celebrate International Women's Day. I'm sorry I can't join you personally today, but I'm sure you're going to have a marvelous time with Baroness Vidira, who has had a successful career in both public sector and the private sector, and I'm proud to say is also a member of our Global Leadership Council. Please today enjoy the food, enjoy the company, enjoy the conversation, but together let's press for progress. Let's move forward towards greater gender equality, and let's see what we can do to make the world a better place through International Women's Day and the other 364 days of the year. Thank you, Peter. And I think lunch is served. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's fantastic to see you all here. It's the second year that we have uh, hosted uh, a lunch for our community for International Women's Day. And at the school, we particularly wanted to have something where we could sit down and talk to each other and exchange ideas, sentiments about International Women's Day, do some networking, and have some meaningful conversations. Because uh, if Oxford is anything, it is a conversation. And uh, on a day like this, it's, it's important to get together. Um, and so I'm really delighted that we have Baroness Federa here with us. Um, she says I'm not allowed to call her Baroness, but I, I said I call you Baroness once. Um, and <laughs> oh no! Um, and Jonathan's already already introduced you, Shriti. But I should say also that she is very much one of our community, um, like Margaret Thatcher, though not like Margaret Thatcher. Um, uh, Shriti. <laughs> is uh, a graduate of uh, Somerville College, where she studied politics, economics, and philosophy. Um, and she said, when we were on the way up here, she said, oh, every time I'm in Oxford and I get off the train, I think, I'm just like a student again. So um, it's, nice, it's nice to have you back uh, in the community. Um, I think her career speaks for itself, but she has had such a varied career from investment banker to politics and now to being the first woman chair of a bank here in the UK, Santander. Um, I understand that when she worked in Gordon Brown's government, she was described as Gordon Brown's representative on earth, okay. Um, and that she had quite a reputation for being, you know, you had to be careful because you, if she asked you a question, you had to be careful how you answered it. So. So now I'm going to ask her some questions, and I think uh, you'll all have a chance to, to ask some questions as well. So should we, should we take a seat, Trudy? Um, it's a very, it's a very, very impressive CV, um, and it sounds when it trips off the tongue, it sounds great, and it sounds easy. I'm sure it wasn't easy. Um, I don't think it was easy, but I have to say I was very lucky, and successful people who think it's all about their incredible talents are, are probably selling you a line because I think, uh, I think as Napoleon said, it's, it's a lot about the luck of the general. So um, I think one of the things that I've learned over time is it's about seizing opportunity. And when the, when the door opens, you've got to take it. And there's something about how you are that also projects to other people that you're up for taking, an you know, taking on an opportunity, and I think that makes them sort of provide it to you. So um, I haven't, you know, a lot of people ask me about role models. Um, first of all, it terrifies me to be a role model. Uh, I have to be honest about that. But I didn't really have many role models. Um, 
but I've had a lot of champions in my life, um, people who've been prepared to back me, uh, and so I would say I've been lucky. So you've had some luck, but you've also made a lot of decisions in your life that have led you to where you are now. Yeah. And when you took that first job in the city, when you left Oxford as a young graduate and mm. took your first job, mm. how much were you thinking about your future? Were you planning it all out? What was your motivation then? Well, I've never, ever planned a single career move um, in my life. It probably shows in the sort of right, slightly checkered nature of it. Um, I, my view of it is you have to spend your time doing something you are passionate about. You should not spend your time worrying about being managing director, uh, you know, being prime minister, uh, earning this much money, uh, getting up onto a corporate hierarchy, um, because those are just things that won't sustain you. If you have spent your time motivated by what you do every single day because you really want to do it, and because you want preferably in my case, you know, I would say because you want to, as Peter said, make the world a better place, do something that changes something for the better. But you, know, you can have all sorts of different ambitions about, about this. What's the worst that can happen? You fail, but at least you spent every day doing something you really want to do. Um, so I've never really had a sort of grand plan, but actually when I left um, Assembleville, I rather sort of desperately needed to get a job uh, because um, I think the great plan that my parents had was for me to have an arranged marriage, and um, the easiest way of escaping that was to get myself a job uh, that brought me some independence. Going into investment banking. Yes, a escaping arranged marriage. marriages. Um, so that was that was the reason I, I picked uh, a job. In fact, I picked only one firm that I really wanted to work for because I was passionate about development. Uh, it was a firm that. Um, advised uh, countries of uh, governments in, in developing countries. Uh, they were not called emerging markets in those days um, uh, on, on, on their international finance, financial issues. So I was kind of finding a way of marrying my passion for development with a sort of having a financial bent and earning enough money to escape. So um, that was how it started. So going into banking because you didn't want to take the choice that your parents would have liked you to take must have been actually a very difficult thing to do. And going into new territory, sometimes yes. against the wishes of your family and friends, yes. takes, takes bravery. What was going well, through your I mind at the time? I couldn't admit that if it was very difficult at the start. I found, I was a little shocked. I think they were a little shocked by me too. I don't think they, I didn't quite fit. Uh, not just because of my gender, but because of my race, and uh, they just didn't have anybody that looked like me. Uh, and uh, one of the first people I worked for said to me, do you know, you're really quite good. I mean, of course, I wouldn't have hired you, uh, but you're really quite good, um, because, and I said, well, why wouldn't you have hired me? And he said, well, you don't look like what our clients want to see. Um, I mean, of course, you get sued if you said something like that today, but I mean, you know, he was perfectly, he was just being completely honest. Um, well, you might not if it was a private conversation, of course. But, yes. So, uh, you know, what would you say to, you know, some of our students, I mean, men and women, but I think, you know, particularly women, um, entering a still very male-dominated environment like investment banking, mm. or I should say politics, though less, less male-dominated than it used to be. What would you say about having to deal with some of those slings and arrows? Um, is it just a case of leaning in and it'll all be okay? Mm. I'm, not, I'm not a great fan of leaning in. I think that there is obviously something in how not all but many women project themselves that is different from the way men project themselves. So if you look at all of the research about job applications, you'll see that uh, a woman won't apply for a job unless she's 100% qualified uh, in the main, and men will apply if they're about 60% qualified. And by the way, I have personal evidence to suggest they also get cross when they don't get the job and they're only 60% <laughs> qualified. And, and do I want women? Yes, I do want women to project and to own. You've got to own the talent you have. You've got to own who you are. And the, the, your manager, your employer, 
they will take at face value what you are projecting. They don't have the time always to, get, to create an objective assessment of your abilities. It's your role to also project it correctly and ensure that they understand it. But having said that, I really would rather have men lean out of it. Um, and you know, I don't want to be interviewing a whole bunch of people who are only 60% qualified. Um, you know, and I think it would be quite a happy medium if they were, you know, everybody was at the 80% mark, then we'd be in a better place. And I think there's a role for employers and for the rest of society, and I don't think that I take it as it's about women changing who they are, and I don't want women. I had to be more like a man when I joined the city. I had to be better, I had to work harder, I had to be more aggressive, um, I had to be tougher. And you know what, I regret it. I don't want to be those things and I don't want women who are coming through the ranks in this generation to have to do that. And we will really have succeeded, by the way, when there are as many mediocre women leaders as there are mediocre men leaders. <laughs> well, I don't think we're there yet, so we're okay. Um, so the, the Financial Times just published uh, in, in, in conjunction with International Women's Day, it's Women in Business uh, Supplement. And on the front page it said that, you know, there's evidence that more women are going away from jobs in the city because they, they feel that they can never make it to the boardroom if they go the traditional route. And they've waited long enough. And so they're going to go and take advantage of places like this, you know, become entrepreneurs and strike out on their own and, and uh, use their talents to run their own businesses. Um, is that a good thing or, or is it a missed opportunity? Well, it's both. Um, I, if we had as many women entrepreneurs in Britain as the, the U.S. has, we, we would be radically increasing our productivity as a, mac, as a macro economy. So we definitely need more women entrepreneurs, but um, we were just talking about the fact that women um, don't get access to capital. Women entrepreneurs do not get access to capital as easily as men, so it's not going to actually be uh, you know, the silver bullet. Um, when you look at fintech, you would have thought fintech would be the one place in finance, startup, fresh, young people, that fintech is even more male dominated um, um, than, you know, than, than a sort of average bank. So I don't think it's, it's a silver bullet. But the other thing to note, I hate to say this in front of Anna, but anyway, not everybody is made out to be, I mean, not everybody is made to be an entrepreneur. And you can't always be the most successful entrepreneur if you've not had some form of work experience. Um, and women are fantastic managers, uh, uh, as well as, you know, uh, uh, you can't be in a world where you're forced to make a certain type of choice. That is just not, that is not what Press for Progress is about. So you moved from banking into the world of politics, and, you know, it could be argued that for any CEO, understanding politics with a big or a small P is, is very important. But it's also an arena that many people struggle in and I think particularly women often feel that you know the the politics of the boardroom is the politics uh, of the golf club or the male orientated world um, how how do you cope with that and what are the skills you think young women need to develop to practice to think about in order to be able to move across worlds and, and right to the top? I don't, I don't know if moving across worlds is for everybody. I wish more people would do it, because if you think about how the world is today, in this, it's very politically uncertain. Um, I think we're living in a very, very difficult time, and I think historic time. Uh, you see the rise of populism, of geopolitical uncertainty, of enormous disruptive innovation, and it's happening all at once. But to understand how the world works, I almost view it as a sort of Venn diagram of you have to understand how commerce and business and um, uh, finance and markets work, and you have to understand how politics and policy works, and you have to understand how economics works. And one of the reasons we had the financial crisis, in my, in my view, is none of those people understood each other. I mean, economics, economists kind of wash out finance as if it sort of is a sort of neutral, neutral force. 
Um, and politicians certainly don't understand either of those two. And, and, and the market doesn't understand how policy is made. And, and then you have these enormous sort of pulling apart of, um, of where the solutions in life lie. So the more people who understand all of those things for me, the better. But it's not the easiest thing to cross. And there have been not very many people who successfully cross. And I guess if I'd really halfway understood what I was getting into every single time, by the way, on anything that I did, I probably wouldn't be doing it. But you know, you just have to kind of do it. And, and Caesar, the time, I mean, I went into, I didn't quite go into politics, but I was offered a job. Um, and I went, to see, uh, I went to see Gordon Brown for uh, what I didn't understand was my interview, but uh, I went to see him. And um, he asked, I had done some work I was one of the two and a half supporters of the Labour Party in the city at that time. And I'd done, I'd done some bits of work about Bank of England independence and everything else when they were in opposition. And when they got in, um, you know, they had reams of civil servants to, to use, so I didn't really sort of hear much other than a Christmas card. And then I get this call and um, thought he, you know, they wanted something else. Um, so I went in and he told me about the five big problems that they have. Uh, um, and could I, could I help? And I sort of said, yes, yeah, sure, thinking oh, he wants me to write another paper. And they said, I can't pay you very much. I said, oh, you don't need to pay me. Why is he offering to pay me? Um, you email <laughs> if you don't mind me saying so. And then I leave the room, and there was uh, Ed Bald and Ed Miliband saying, so did you take the job? And I'm going, what job? You know, what are you talking about? Nobody offered me a job. And then it was all too embarrassing to go back, so I did it. <laughs> you know, it was, that was it, really. <laughs> It worked out okay. I right? thought I'd do it for a couple of years, and I was there ten years later. Yeah, so. yeah it worked out okay. I want to give um, other people in the room a chance to, to ask Trudy some questions. I think we do have some, some microphones. So, um, uh, who would like to ask a question? If you do ask a question, I would just say no multiple questions, okay? One question at a time. And uh, if you ask a question, can you please briefly say who you are? So, who would like to go first? This lady here. Uh, th thanks very much for uh, your conversation so far. I'm Susan Graham, I'm an entrepreneur uh, here in Oxford. And my question is around uh, action. So it feels like we're moving, this wave is moving from talk to now empowerment and action. And in terms of empowerment specifically, what do you think the, the future next five years of empowerment for women might look like? What, what are the things that people are going to be doing instead of saying uh, that you think will empower women? Um, I, I have been... I have been shocked, but not surprised by me too. Um, um, it's, it's certainly shown me that I'm not too old to be shocked, um, uh, and some of the things that you you see are shocking. So I, I hope that we can use this moment um, to go beyond um, the issues of um, sexual harassment into how women are treated, how they experience things, how they feel when in the workplace how they're assessed, um, how they are uh, talked about in the press. So the, one of the most important things for me is all of the er uh, areas around unconscious bias. And in Santander, we spend enormous amounts of time. We have, a, we have an app that we use to look at the ads we put out internally for jobs, which sometimes use language that is really off-putting. Um, we give reverse mentoring to senior men just so that they from, you know, they're mentored by young women to understand what it actually feels like. And I, I think that we also need to think about language. Um, you were hesitating, Cathy, I, I noticed, to use some of the adjectives that have been used uh, about me. And you shouldn't hesitate because, you know, at well, the well, end... It's too late now. The introduction's over. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I've been called all sorts of things. Um, uh, not ever meant in a... In a you know, in, in a positive way. And if you, you, if you think about the words that are used for women, strident, uh, sort of emotional, when a man would be sort of, you know, assertive, sensitive, um, th 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 that's the sort of difference in language. And how we should act in the workplace 
to make a woman feel comfortable. It's not just about leaning in. There's an obligation on the other side. And I think every corporate and every business, even a startup or a FTSE 100, has this obligation that is beyond the recruitment. Everybody focuses on the recruitment. Nobody focuses on the women who are there. And that's what we need to do. And for me, getting to a place where this is not an issue anymore. I don't think it'll be five years, but I'm more hopeful than I've ever been. Next question. Oh, oh my goodness, nobody has any questions at all. This lady over here. Hi, I'm Paola Bergamaschi and I'm a member of the board of a couple of banks and I've been in banking all my life. So I'm here as a guest today. Uh, so thank you for your speech, very inspirational. My question is really, uh, you know, very long term. So we are celebrating the centenary of giving women a vote. What do you think is the breakthrough that can be comparable to that, that can happen in our generation? <sighs> that's, a very, that's a very difficult one. I, I would, for me, you mean the equivalent public move that is not about gender but about something else. I think, for me, it has to be around equality and opportunity. We have created a very disturbingly um, unequal world, and we see that in the rise of populism today, um, and we see it everywhere in populism in the Western world, not not, not, in, not in emerging markets yet. Um, they have a different set of problems. Um, if you look at the beneficiaries of globalization, it was the Western elite and it was lower and middle classes in emerging markets. And um, the ones that suffered from it were the lower and middle classes of, of the Western world. And now we're surprised. We're surprised by Trump and we're surprised by Brexit. We have not created a economic structure that actually is distributing fairly, not through redistribution. I'm not a great sort of redistribution person. I, it's about the participation in the creation of the wealth that is fair. Um, and we haven't done that. And we, I think I'm really ashamed to be a part of a generation that is going to be the first that bequeaths a worse life to younger people in 100 years. And it's just not good enough. I think there was another question somewhere over here. Yeah. Hi. Is this on? Yes. Hi, I'm Katie Corral. I'm an MBA student. And you made a couple of statements about, you know, how being a role model is a little bit scary, but also about ways that you've been described, you know, strident and things like that. When I, you know, explained to people I knew that you'd be speaking, they said, oh, I've heard of her. She suffers no fools. And fools don't really like that very much. <laughs> um, at least I'm learning myself. So, if if those coming out, you know, behind you in our careers as women, are also to be suffering no fools, but also maybe not having to act quite like men that you know our mothers and grandmothers and whoever have had to do, what does that actually look like? Like, what what are the behaviors that we do need to be exhibiting in the workplace that say I'm ready for the opportunity? but also I'm, I still am a woman with all the things that that brings and the multiplicity of selves that that brings. Like, what does that even look like? Because I'm just a little lost in that space, so. Well, I think you've answered your own question, actually. <laughs> because there is no, we are not, our gender is not our only defining um, uh, characteristic. Yes, we have to own it, but the single most important thing is to be comfortable with who you are and not have to be somebody else. That does, of course, involve owning your difference and owning your gender as a part of your difference in some situations um, uh, because, you know, for some, for some reason, 50% is a minority. But, um, <laughs> uh, but we have to own who you are. And if you can't be who you are at work all of the time, just think of how incredibly uncomfortable that might be. Um, John Brown, who was um, the CEO of uh, BP, who uh, was then had to leave um, for a number of complicated reasons, but essentially because he was hiding the fact that he was gay. 
um, and he wrote a book called uh, The Glass Closet, and he talked about being, you know, at that time considered one of the most successful uh, chief executive on the FTSE 100, and he was hiding the fact that he was gay, and he was so miserable and so uncomfortable. And I tell you something, he would have been a much better CEO if he was able to be who he was. So you have to own who you are, and whether it is uh, a, a, on, in the spectrum, a little bit on the shy and retiring side. Well, that's, you know, people have to accommodate. Whether it's being on the assertive side, well, that's what has to be accommodated. Whether it's collaborative, whether it's introverted thinker, you have to be who you are and you have to own it. Own your difference. It's your strength. One more question. Just over here. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Bushen Jovu. I'm part of the MBA program. Um, I think sort of starting out professionally, we kind of had a very similar um, experience in the sense I come from investment banking. And my question is really more towards, obviously you're a woman, but also you kind of are a minority. And I do a lot of like um, mentoring of young women. And I often get asked, you know, uh, what, like, do you have any words of wisdom? And I, I can't really speak to anyone else's experience except for mine. So my question really is, um, has being um, double taxed, how has that affected you? But also if you could actually sort of speak to like young women, young minority women who sort of are looking up to you, what few words of advice would you actually give? So how, how has being a minority In both ways, not you, just. As well, yeah. as being, as well as being a woman, yeah. And advice to other young women from minority communities, yeah. yeah. I, I said once, I regret it, um, but in my very first ever public interview, um, it actually was Peter Mandelson who said, for God's sake, go out and give, us, give an interview because you are just this mythology, this creature that nobody knows and they can write anything they want about you, so go out there and do an interview. And um, I was asked this question um, at my interview about being a woman from an ethnic minority, and I said at the time, because I wanted the interview to be about focusing on, as it turns out, the financial crisis, which was the thing that was happening at the time, um, I sort of said, I wear my gender and my race very lightly. Um, because I didn't want everything to be about that. I, I regret that a lot, because it, it takes a while to own, you know, I say own your difference, it took me a while to own my difference. And I didn't want that to be the center of the piece. I wanted you know, what we were doing in the financial crisis to be the sort of center of the piece. Um, but I think I've had to grow and learn and accept my own discomfort at being a role model, because all I can see is, oh my god, the hundreds of things I did wrong. I don't want them doing that. You know, so um, <laughs> you have to, you have to grow, grow into it. And the, the, the only real advice that I could give you is to sum up what some of the things I've said, which is you must do what you're passionate about. Do not try and change something because you think it's the right thing to do, because you know, your parents want you to do it, because you know, it's kind of the thing that earns the most money, whatever it is. You have to do what you're passionate about. You have to own who you are and not be ashamed of it, because you're going to have to own it for the rest of your life, and it's really, really tiring to be trying to be somebody else and to actually make sure that you understand that whole sort of nature of being uncomfortable, not projecting yourself. Um, I get that. I've been there. Uh, and it doesn't seem like it now because, you know, you, you learn it. But that puts an obligation on the other person to then reach out and understand you and make an effort. Well, the least you can do is meet them halfway. So I wouldn't be leaning in or leaning out. I'd be standing up straight and, you know, owning who you are. So we, we've, um, we've just... Yeah. <laughs> we've just done some research here. Um, a couple of my colleagues um, are here at the business school. Some interviews with women CEOs about how they got to the top, how they managed themselves, what they thought about their path on the way up. Um, it's, a, it's an oversimplification, but I'm allowed to do that because I'm not the research academic who did the research. So, and the oversimplification is 
the message from them was, don't wait to be asked. Don't count on others, which I was surprised about. And make sure you play a long game. Right or wrong? <laughs> or discuss, we're at Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> That's a better approach. That's a better approach. Um, I have the responsibility to lead an organization. So I have to view it from the other side, which is the obligation is also on us as the employer. It isn't just about the women. And I think when you read and hear about some of the things that they have to face. Um, I heard, um, I talked to, uh, uh, in my eyes, young women, a uh, woman who came to sort of see me um, the other day and talked about her career prospects. And she said to me, she was Spanish. She had moved from Madrid five years ago. And she'd asked to come to London because that's where the global market is. This is where she wanted to be. And the first question she had been asked when she said, can, can I, do you think there's a post somewhere in London? He said, but aren't you married? And I was like, oh my God. I mean, I just, we can't have that. We can't have, I mean, so even inside your own organization, you're shot. So, you know, yes, I don't disagree with that. So long as it's not forcing you to be something else, something you're not. But I'll tell you, my focus right now, it's the obligation is on the employer. Yeah. I just want to end with a quote that you gave in the past, yeah. I think in an interview with Sunville College, um, which really, uh, I was trying to do, do my due diligence and uh, do a bit of research. And I read this and I was really touched by it. Um, you said that managers perceive the limits that you feel inside before they see your limits objectively. So don't let, lim let limits imagined in your head cap, cap the achievements that reality might bring for you. And I just thought that, that really summed it up, that you know, don't, don't let others' perceptions of you uh, confine your own ambition and your own aspiration. And um, you are incredibly inspiring. You, you're really inspiring, Shruti. And uh, I'd just like to ask, if you don't mind, if you can just leave us with, with one more thought that, you know, to all of, all of the, the women here in the room and my male colleagues and, and friends who've, who've joined us today, you know, um, a sort of summing up from you of what you'd like to see next for yourself and for all of us? Well, it won't be what you're expecting. <laughs> <laughs> I was asked, what did I regret the most about well, what happened, you know, my career and how I handled my youth. And I kind of, it was, in, it was on the BBC, so that was a bit embarrassing. But, um, and I just blurted it out because it was kind of what I'd been thinking about that morning. And it was, I don't think I had enough fun. <laughs> so whatever you're doing, just make sure you're enjoying it. Because, you know, this is it. It's not a dress rehearsal. These are the days you have. So just just have to enjoy what you're doing. And if you're structurally not enjoying it, leave it and move on. Well, you've still got time. We've all, we've all still got time. We've right? still got so, time. Um, That's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. Shruti, thank, thank you so much for joining us. It was oh, wonderful to have you with us. Thank the Baroness for your very, very inspiring discussion uh, alongside Kathy. Uh, of course, we'd like to thank Anna Bakshi and the Foundry for hosting this fantastic event. And we want to extend a special thanks to both Rasha Khwaja and uh, Catherine Rowe, who are members of our school board. So thank you all very much. Uh, and just one minute of a, a few thoughts I wanted to share with you as a faculty member at the business school. Uh, I have the privilege of teaching an amazing cohort, cohort of uh, future business leaders. And I'm proud to say that our MBA class, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, is over 40% female. Very, very proud of that. The highest in Europe, as, as we just heard. Importantly, these women were not admitted because they were female. They were admitted because they possessed the experience, attitude, and acumen to succeed in global leaders as what we all know is an increasingly complex world. 
And I can honestly, honestly say that the quality of their contributions is as good, if not better, than those of their male counterparts, and that the classroom environment and quality of discussions has greatly benefited from having the more balanced gender representation. Um, of course, this is very consistent with all the research that's reliably shown that gender diversity, along with other forms of workplace diversity, improve a vast array of organizational outcomes. Oh, now it's working. Uh, I've also have the honor of serving as the coordinator of women's faculty and researcher events at the school, giving me the privilege of interacting with fantastic female academics who are top scholars in their fields, many of whom are here today. Uh, and some of you may have managed, the Facebook live, managed to watch the Facebook Live discussion with Victoria Beckham earlier, in which they discussed the importance of having uh, relatable role models, which we discussed again today. And I do see in those colleagues incredible role models for our students, and in my senior female colleagues, incredible role models for myself. So I feel very, very privileged uh, in that regard. And so, as we hear these estimates from the World Economic Forum stating that gender parity is 200 years away, uh, based on my experiences here um, and beyond, uh, I think that we're a lot closer to that, to that and I think today's event was uh, exemplary of that. So thank you all again for being here and for joining us in our commitment to Press for Progress. Enjoy your dessert.